Today on the final bar, we recap the movements in today's markets. Energy, really the emerging story today with a lot of upside moves with some of the big energy names down to some of the smaller refiners and so forth with defense at the uh, at the bottom of the list with staples, utilities and so forth. We're going to open up the uh, final bar mailbag, answer some questions on candlesticks and volume and a shifting stock segment where we'll break down all the big moves in financials, energy and elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar on Monday, November 4th. Really appreciate you joining me. My name is Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Uh, We're having a shifting stock segment later today. I feel like that segment should we should maybe highlight any of the names that have not been shifting because it's been quite a volatile move with a lot of a lot of charts really changing character or maybe clarifying direction in the last uh, you know Friday into today's trading. You know, clearly a nice, uh, a nice upside, and we're going to break down all of that uh, activity. Also, we have a talking technically segment. My friend Tom Boley is going to talk about seasonality charts, and we're in that seasonally really compelling part of the year when most market, uh, you know, crashes and real negative moves have happened in October, November. So we'll see what he has to say about that. Before we get to the contents of the show, I did want to remind everyone I'll be speaking this coming Friday at the Las Vegas Traders Expo. We'll be heading down there Wednesday night, spending Thursday and Friday interviewing a number of the speakers. And we'll hope to share a lot of that content with you on Thursday and Friday, but then into the coming weeks as well. We'll try to um, unpack a lot of people's uh, you know, experts' opinions on their uh, on the markets, but also their process, their routines, how they make decisions, and so forth. There's a website on the screen. You're welcome to, to head there. There are a lot of streaming options if you can't to get to Las Vegas. But if you do, please make sure you say hello after the presentation. It'd be great to, to meet some of you in person. So, you know, looking at the action today, you know, energy has really been the, <clears throat> the big sector today emerging with, uh, you know, up over 3%. The S&P overall up about 37 basis points, just over a third of a percent, you know, opened uh, way up. Sorry, this is the S&P 500, opening up pretty far up, sort of slowly giving some of that back during the day, but overall, you know, much higher than Friday. And Friday was really sort of a closing at the high you know, really strong finish to last week. And then today we kind of come in with another big jump higher. There's obviously a lot of uh, a lot of news flow that's uh, causing that trade, uh, you know, trade uh, rumors and trade uh, headlines that are certainly fueling some of that. But in the end, you know, this is all about looking at the charts and how they connect to the long term. So it's worth noting that the MEI trade clearly leading today, that's materials, energy, industrials, also financials. So really a cyclical led, um, you know, uh, rally today. On the downside, we have some of the traditional defense. So down 1% or more consumer staples, real estate, and utilities. One of the ratios we've looked at a lot is consumer discretionary versus staples. Um, we're going to show an example of that a little bit later. Um, but I, I did want to make sure that I, uh, that I highlight that chart for you. I think part of the three and three, we'll look at that ratio chart of discretionary versus staples because today's trading really is starting to clarify rotation more toward offense in a way that we've not seen in, in quite a while. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500 and then we'll come back to some of the, you know, under the hood comments about what's happened. So here's the last couple of weeks. This is the month of October, the first two days lower, but then, you know, really since the, the third, second and third uh, days of the month, it's just gone further and further. And then uh, first couple of days in November here, uh, going very, very well. Today, if you're a candlestick aficionado, if you look at candles a lot, what would you call today? Anyone know? So that's a doji candle, uh, pretty common if you look at candlestick uh, charts. If not, don't worry. I, I always tell people with candle charts, we're going to talk about them during the mailbag. So I never worry too much about what they're called. I worry much more about what they tell you. And essentially, a doji candle is when you have the open and close right about at the same level. And then you have the uh, shadow or the stem of the candle, um, you know, high and low range. So it's essentially when the open and close don't really directionally move somewhere. It's not like a big accumulation day, a big distribution day. It's sort of an eh day. It's sort of a sideways day where open and close are sort of in harmony. That usually suggests short term reversal. So if you're coming in an uptrend and you see that, usually means the next bar or two are going to be lower. If you're in a downtrend and you see it, 
it would mean the next couple of bars would be higher. So just based on the close versus open, that's what it's suggesting. Now we're looking at the S&P cash index. So I would caution you of making too much of, a, of an assumption based on that. Good to look at some of the ETFs and, and essentially some of the big names to see if that would validate. But, you know, clearly a follow through to the upside, you know, just based on uh, Friday into today, those are two days really confirming that it's sort of long and strong up into the right to uncharted territory, another new trading high, another new closing high today. Let's look a little further down at some of the uh, global ETFs, global markets, and then also some of the industry theme themes that we can unpack here. So at the top of the return list in terms of the global ETFs, so this is a universe that I put together, just a bunch of uh, international ETFs, US traded ETFs that track global markets. So it's sort of adjusting for currencies because these are all traded in US dollars. Um, so uh, you can see Taiwan, China, Hong Kong, basically anything related to China really at the top of the list here. This is the FXI, which is what we usually use um, to track China. But again, any of those would be would be fair game. They just look at different buckets of the Chinese markets. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, end of last week, I think it was Thursday or Friday, we did a, uh, a section where I talked about uh, ETF construction and, and mentioned particularly about the China ETF. So take a look back there on our YouTube channel if you missed it. But on the FXI, you have this trend line taking the high from april again the high from the end of june beginning of july there as we go further on we then in the last just couple days really have completed the transition back above that trend line which is pretty significant also above the 200 day moving average here in red so both of those have gone higher now also above the most recent swing high which is from uh, the peak in september so all of those things sort of according to an upside transition for china and again the rumors that we have there are what have driven things up on the downside there were a couple things down india maybe most notably because that's a chart that has looked very very good um you know one of the one of the weaker uh movements on relative uh relative to other global indexes. Looking at the industries here very quickly, and I just wanted to remind you, if you missed our discussions on Thursday and Friday, I don't know if Chip mentioned it on his show on, on Saturday, but we now have scooter rankings or the technical ranking system for all the Dow industry indexes, which is the way that we look at industries for the most part on our platform. So uh, in a lot of places, you'll start to see those surface. It's a great way to sort of uh, look at relative strength and weakness across all the industries. We're just looking right now at today's returns to see what led on the way up. So aluminum actually up the most. You can see a number of energy uh, groups up here, integrated oil, those are things like um, Exxon, Chevron, sort of the big integrated names you probably know, but also others uh, a little down the uh, the cap tier list. But a lot of MEI, sort of materials, energy, industrials, that's most of the top 10 groups sort of in there uh, in that, uh, in that uh, bucket. On the downside, we have home construction, non-durable household products, water stocks, home construction, uh, things like home builders really were one of the weaker groups today. We'll, uh, in the shifting stocks segment, we'll break down uh, Lennar, maybe some of the other home builders, just look at those patterns very quickly. But you know, overall, not the end of the world on a long-term basis, but in the short term on an up day with the market going to new highs, this has been a group that's actually done very, very well and now rotating lower. We're also going to look at McDonald's, maybe some other restaurants, and, and that notably on the, uh, on the worst list today, um, one of the 10 weakest sectors. So, you know, certainly a lot of movement in there. And again, on, on a day that was up a good amount, you had from 4.9% up to 4% down. So if you're looking at the industries, there's a lot of movement in there if you can capture those and pay attention to some of those relative movements. So that's a recap for today, um, Monday, November 4th. I now want to go to our next segment, which is the um, final bar mailbag. Um, those of you who have been watching the show, really appreciate all your questions. You can get to us three ways. One is the final bar at stockcharts.com to shoot us an email. The second is on Twitter at final bar SCTV. Just send us a message there. And then the final one is to... Um, uh, just put in a, a comment in the chat room that's open during the show right now. Um, we capture all of those. We look through those as a group and make sure that we address some of the best questions uh, on a future broadcast. So appreciate all your questions. One of the questions that came in, I think, on Friday was about candlestick analysis, and it was on uh, the uh, semiconductors uh, index. I'm looking at the SMH. That's one of the popular semiconductor ETFs. Uh, it's right here. So this is probably Thursday. I'm guessing we had that question because this was Friday. So Thursday, the question was, what kind of candle is that and what does it mean? So what I'm going to do is take a quick step back, give you a candle 101 primer, and then we will uh, yeah, figure out what that candle actually was. Um, as a quick introduction, um, this uh, is the very technologically forward thinking uh, approach of sketching something out on a piece of paper on my desk and then taking a picture with my phone. So you're really getting a behind the scenes look at how I, how I sketch things out. Funny story about this. So about 
15 years ago, my job, I was at Bloomberg in New York City, and I spent a lot of my time on the trading desks in New York and uh, New Jersey and Connecticut. Uh, and I was at the Citigroup trading desk. About once a month, I would do a little uh, teach-in about 7 a.m. for all their equity traders, get about 15 of them in a room, and I'd, I'd sort of uh, run them through a couple quick charts. The one morning I go and my laptop just complete died right at 702 when I'm trying to fire these things up. And I don't know if you know any equity traders, professional equity traders, they have an attention span of about half a second and then they're ready to move on to something else. So at the risk of losing them, I put, pulled out the napkin from the coffee shop in the lobby of the building and I started drawing something very similar to this. And I said, all right, we're gonna talk about one thing. It's hammer candles. Here's what they look like. Here's how you use them. In the end, it was one of the more memorable meetings out of all the things I did, they remembered this napkin sketch so i'm showing you a version of that so just real quick this is what I'm, I'm sketching a candle and when i draw the candle i'm sort of showing the open and close there and then the uh, shadow shows you the high low range the open and close are represented by the body of the candle i do this little slashed mark just meaning it could be an open candle an up close or a solid candle a down close this just means either it's irrelevant which is which for the for the sake of this uh quick discussion the second thing I'm going to show you is, um, you know, the question was, was this candle bullish or bearish? And there's really two types of candles that I'll, I'll talk about. One where the open and close are at the upper end of the range or where the open and close are at the lower end of the range. So this is where you open down around here, you trade up, but by the close, you're back down around the uh, the open for the day. And the answer to your question about semiconductors is it, is it depends. It depends on the trend leading up to that candle. So at the top, we have an uptrend leading up to this type of candle or an uptrend leading up to this other type of candle. The names of these are all different because the one is the shape of the candle, the second is what's happened leading up to the candle. And every one of these is a reversal pattern. So this is basically called a shooting star candle where you have an uptrend, you have an open trade higher, close down by the open. That suggests down, uh, down move in the coming days. The opposite, which would be called a hanging man, which is an uptrend, a open and close at the top with the lower uh, range there. That's also a negative candle indicating reversal. And again, think of it just like the doji candle we saw in the S&P today. The open and close really directionally haven't gone anywhere. You've sort of stalled out of the previous trend and it's suggesting we reverse. At the bottom, if this is coming in a downtrend, they actually have different names and they're both bullish, right? It's a, it's a reversal candle. So it depends on the, on the lead in. This is actually, um, uh, so this one on the right is called a hammer. On the left, it's called an inverted hammer. Think of it as a hammer hammering out a bottom. So anytime you see either of these candles, after a downtrend, it's suggesting a short-term up move. So if we go to that chart of the semiconductors, so now you have to answer the question of what is the trend leading up to the candle? So the way I see it is this, even though the primary trend is up, we've now had a sell-off of two days. So the fact that after a two-day sell-off, you have that emerge, in my opinion, that suggests a reversal to the upside. It tells you that quick down move that you've had has sort of stalled. Both of those sort of candles suggest a little reversal to the upside, and that's sort of what's uh, what's played out since then. So that is my quick primer tutorial on candlesticks, specifically those, um, those hammer-looking types of candles. Four different names. Don't worry too much about that. Worry about the fact that if you see them, it's a reversal of the previous trend, whatever's leading up to it. Thanks so much for that question, by the way. Second one was on volume and looking at the volume in the broad market and saying, does it worry you at all that the volume has actually been uh, been light going into um, the end of the week? And, uh, you know, the short answer is not a ton. I would say when you think about, uh, you know, what these things kind of mean, it, it certainly could um, suggest a, uh, you know, a weakening in in, uh, in, in breadth, right? So uh, this is the chart of the spiders. As you can see, the last month has been a stronger move with the market going to new highs. But if you look at the overall trend in the volume, overall sort of lesser volume, right? You had a lot of strong volume days earlier on in the move, but that sort of tapered off. And you see that pattern actually a number of times here uh, recently where the volume sort of tapered, tapered off a little bit on the up move. Um, so does that concern me? I mean, that's sort of the strict interpretation of it. I would say an acceleration of the volume in the last week on the spiders certainly suggests a nice accumulation leading into the market going to new highs. I'd bucket that maybe short-term positive, uh, all else being equal. But in general, I, you, know, I, you can probably tell from the charts that I show, I very rarely show volume uh, on individual names or on the broad indexes. And the reason is because, to be honest with you, over time, that's sort of fallen out more and more, fallen out of my uh, toolkit. I used to look at volume a great deal when I was learning technical analysis. This was maybe 19, 20 years ago. Um, but since then, over time, just be based on the structural changes in the market, supply and demand and everything, I've sort of looked at it 
uh, uh, less and less. I would tell you that a lot of the measures of breadth that we've talked about, I would argue sort of fit into that um, sort of that volume picture. Um, so we'll look at the mindful inve- mindful live uh, mindful investor live chart list, excuse me. And here we're looking at something like the new highs and new lows. Uh, while very different from volume, it's sort of the way to look at the overall market movement and then see whether it's qualified by a secondary indicator. In this case, looking at new highs, new lows. One of the things that I've been seeing is that as, when the market's gone higher, you have sort of a decrease in new highs. Um, and what we've actually seen is on Friday's close, that pattern almost uh, reversed where, where you all of a sudden had a huge influx of new highs and we'll have to see today, I would assume we'll see that uh, continue to be pretty elevated, but basically telling you a lot of stocks actually participating going to new highs here. So the short answer is I'm not as concerned about volume, but if you're a strict volume analyst, I could see it being you know longer term, a little more uh, questionable that we've had less and less volume on these uh, on these up moves. The last question, just very, very quickly, was on bullish percent and, and, uh, and asking about bullish percent indexes. I did want to point out, if you're not familiar with that, um, someone had asked in the chart room, and I appreciate uh, one of our fellow viewers actually answered the question with you. So um, it's great to see some interaction from some of the more knowledgeable viewers of the final bar. Thanks so much for your, for your help and, and, uh, and making this more of a community. But if you go to the market summary page and you make it um, uh, to the very, very bottom of the page, you will see a list of bullish percent indexes. Um, this is showing you what percent of the stocks in each of these different buckets are in a buy signal versus a sell signal based purely on point and figure charting. And if you mouse over it, you can see a quick little preview chart of what those things look like. Um, what I like to do is actually sort the list, and sorry, I'm getting a little little uh, bonus chart there. If you sort the list just based on the value down here, so if I click here and sort it on strongest to weakness, that will show you from the strongest bullish percent down to the weakest bullish percent, what constituents are in a buy signal versus a sell signal. So at the bottom, you have energy and consumer staples with about half of the stocks in a buy signal, which means half of them still in a sell signal have not gotten the buy signal yet. Whereas at the top, utilities, and again, if you look at a chart of utilities, it makes perfect sense. It's been sort of up in the up into the right long and strong for quite a while. So it makes sense that the bullish percent is so positive. So keep an eye on that. Uh, Thoughts on seasonality charts, really interesting points. Uh, We'll be back in a minute. Today's market volatility provides savvy traders and active investors with an abundance of profitable opportunities. At the Traders Expo Las Vegas, November 7th through 9th, over 75 of the most respected traders in the world, including Dennis Gartman, Tom Sosnoff, Todd Gordon, and Tom DeMarc, will explain how they're adapting their strategies and share the specific trading opportunities they've identified in equities, options, forex, futures, cryptocurrencies, and more. Claim your free pass to join them at TradersExpo.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today on the final bar, I want to turn it over to my friend Tom Boley. He recorded some comments recently looking at seasonality charts. One of the really cool features about stockcharts.com, the ability to look at seasonal trends. And this time of year, sort of the October, November period, is when the theme starts to come up because we can talk about seasonal weakness in October and November. We're entering the seasonally strongest part of the year, November to May. So a lot of things to unpack. So let's hear from Tom and I'll be back in two minutes. Seasonality is a great tool to be used with other forms of technical analysis. For instance, if you start from the members dashboard uh, here at Stock Charts and click on the drop down menu and find seasonality, I'm going to give you an example on a stock booking holdings. So we pull this chart up, you're going to see a five period or five year default. And you can grab the slider, move it over to the maximum number of years, which is 20. And if you look below each of these calendar months, you'll see the average return that this particular stock has uh, generated since uh, really the turn of the century. In January, Booking Holdings has averaged gaining 5.7%. In February, 8.6%. March, 7.6%. April, 12.7%. 
So if you simply add that across, you're going to be looking at about 34% or so that booking holdings has averaged over the last 20 years. Now we could take it a step further and move over to the chart. And if you were looking at this 10 year chart, you might not notice that seasonality, but by having used that seasonality tool that I just showed you, you can see that when we highlight the first four months of each one of these calendar years, just about each year produces really nice gains. Uh, again, without that seasonality tool, you might not have recognized that particular tendency. So again, when you go back in, you use the seasonality tool, many times you'll be able to find tendencies uh, within stocks or within industry groups that can help you with your trading. So that was Tom Bully talking about seasonality charts. It's in guys like Tom that have been using this product so well for so long. I feel like he'll forget more about stock charts than I will ever know, but such a good uh, good opportunity to learn from from guys like that. And and again with uh it's it's all about what I found with the seasonality charts when you bring it up. It's all about the data that you're using. So pay attention to what time frames you're looking at here. I'm looking at the last 5 years, but you can obviously draw that back to a longer period of time, start to draw some uh, general conclusions about what you've seen. And again, a lot of times it's based on a broader market trend, but this is just looking for the repetitive patterns, the cyclical nature of the markets. Um, we're going to be sitting down with uh, Jeff Hirsch this week down in uh, at the Traders Expo in Las Vegas. Uh, his father, Yale Hirsch, started the Stock Traders Almanac years and years and years ago, really a pioneer in seasonal trends and seasonal trading. So it'd be really cool to sort of uh, pick uh, Jeff's brain a little bit about some of the seasonal trends and what it means leading into year end here in 2019. So thanks so much for that, Tom. Next segment is called Shifting Stocks. As you probably know, we like to uh, take some time, uh, occasionally look at a lot of individual names, see what's moving, see what themes we can unpack. And again, I found a lot of individual investors, if you get too caught up in the high level stuff, the top down stuff, the S&P, the Russell, <coughs> excuse me, um, and even broad sectors, you're missing a lot of opportunities at the industry, at the theme level, at the cap level, um, and at the uh, uh, at the individual stock level. And, and, and a tool like Stock Charts, you really have the ability to dig into a lot of really cool themes on here. So I just wanted to highlight some of the things that I'm singing. And again, if you're not as familiar with, uh, with, with what I'm doing, I'd, I'd pay attention to the Scooter Reports uh, tools and also put them on your dashboard. That's a great way to sort of hone in on some of the names that are moving that you may want to pay attention to. I'm just going to jump around to some of the names that have popped up on on my list. I actually wanted to start um, looking at the dashboard, looking at my chart lists. One of the things that Greg Schnell actually encouraged me to do was set up chart lists for all the different sectors. And it was time really well spent because now you can actually go through, for me, go through by sector, by group. So here I'm looking at financials. I'm going through the asset managers, and it's funny, things like Northern Trust actually going to new closing highs today, new price highs today. I um, want to get down to some of the banks here. You'll notice most of the charts in this sector are sort of breaking out to the upside, which is why the chart of the XLF looks so good. But when we finally get down to JP Morgan, this is now getting into the banks. Look at how strong some of these charts are, right? So JP Morgan consistently now new uh, trading highs, new closing highs. Some of the regional banks uh, also as well. So this is PNC banks uh, based out of Pittsburgh. Uh, going to the next page, we have U.S. Bank Corps to new highs. We have Bank of America at new closing highs. We have First Republic at new closing highs. You get the pattern that I'm sort of showing you here. So a lot of the banks, we've talked about the chart of the XLF, how it needs to follow through. And we certainly got some follow through last week. And just today, with the nice move up and a lot of up closes, a lot of these banks uh, confirming new closing highs, breaking above resistance. And I think that's a really important big picture theme uh, that you may or may not be uh, be familiar with. Second one is in energy. So a lot of the energy charts have been very forgettable um, because they've just been so relatively weak. This is a chart of ExxonMobil. Look at the relative performance has just been dire for the last six months for sure, but really for the last year as well, right? Just the stepwise motion lower and lower. Now, the last couple days have not completely erased this trend leading up to uh, the, the rally of the last couple of days, but it certainly has changed the character. So now we've broken to a new swing high. This is ExxonMobil. Uh, we could look at Chevron. Exxon and Chevron are really the two big integrated names. Uh, all the rest are sort of uh, much smaller. Those two stocks are a huge weight 
on the energy sector. You can see both of them between Friday and today have broken to new swing highs, really following through to the upside. But I would say further down the cap chair, if you look at something like Phillips 66, there are actually some really attractive um, consistent outperforming charts within energy. It's not just the big ones that have been beaten down that are starting to reverse. I'd encourage you to look a little further down. So this is in that same uh, industry group, but have been much stronger charts. That's PSX. Um, home builders we mentioned, I wanted to point out uh, Lennar Homes. This is one of the names that's uh, been one of the stronger ranked names. And again, it's not the end of the world yet. It's just a little bit of a pullback. But on a day when so many stocks like the financials, like energy really rallying, you can see why home builders on a relative basis look so much weaker. That's why home construction was one of the worst, uh, worst groups today. Restaurants have been a really tough part. Um, back here over the summer, they had been just fantastic long-term charts, breaking to new relative highs, consistent new price highs, but you can see how the character of these charts is completely reversed. So now this is McDonald's breaking down through the 50-day, down through the 200-day, continuing to, to make lower lows and lower highs. That's not the type of chart that you'd want to be paying attention to. Um, just a couple other quick names that caught my eye during my uh, review of the S&P 500 over the weekend. Disney, certainly one of the more challenged charts, but potentially finding support at the 200-day moving average. Gapped up a little bit today, but a little more distribution going into the close today. So if stocks like that are able to hold um, the the uh, the 200 day, I think will be really, really, really key. And I also just want to encourage you before we move on is to look within Staples. There's some really interesting charts. Uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance WBA breaking above uh, resistance breaking to new uh, uh, new highs. You compare that with some of the other names within uh, within Staples that look a lot uh, a lot less uh, less attractive. So certainly pay attention to some of the names further down uh, in the list. There, boy, shifting stocks could be an hour. I feel like just on that one thing alone. But we need to get to the end of the show, and that means we get to the the uh, three and three. This is at the end of every show. We like to look at three charts in three minutes and hit on three key themes that you should be aware of. And again, if you're not looking at these charts, you should be and pay attention to them in the coming weeks. I think they will tell you a lot about the character of the market. So the first one, we, we hinted at this earlier, looking at consumer discretionary versus consumer staples. And this is a ratio that we pay attention to on our main Mindful Investor Live chart list. Uh, and we've talked about the fact that this has not been confirming a new uptrend, right? So the market's gone to new highs. Look at how this ratio has been trending lower. That character has really been changing. And I can't say that this is negative anymore. It certainly is sideways, if not starting to show some positive signs. So on a ratio like this, you look on uh, for a rotation from distribution, which has been favoring staples, to consolidation, which means the two uh, sectors are essentially in line, and look for rotation to a more accumulative phase, a more positive phase. We have not had that final transition where we're getting a new high in the ratio. All we're doing is we're not going to a new low, which essentially tells you it's neutral at this point. But if and when that would rotate higher, that would tell you an emergence of strength in, in the offensive part of, uh, of consumer versus defense. Second one is the relative performance of semiconductors. A question earlier we addressed was on candle charts related to the SMH, but just looking at the relative performance, that is certainly has followed through to the upside. If you're using this based on, you know, in a vacuum that is undeniably bullish by any measure, the, the strength in, uh, in semiconductors. So certainly uh, pay attention to that. The third one, someone had asked about the U.S. versus non-U.S. stocks. And we've talked about, you know, I, I'm always wondering where the pain trade is going to be, meaning something, a theme, an emerging performer, relative uh, strength or weakness, it's going to catch a lot of people on the wrong side of it. And, and they'll be underprepared and as a result, feel a lot of pain. I think this is one that, that is still emerging here. This is the relative performance of the U.S., versus the global uh, index, ACWI, which is All Country World Index, ACWI is the ETF you can use. And if you look at a ratio of the SPY, the spiders, versus ACWI, look at how the U.S. had outperformed for much of this year leading into the fall, but in the last two months, you've seen that ratio roll over. And now we've uh, you know put in a new relative low a couple weeks ago, traded up, but again, it's not really bullish. At this point, it's sort of more negative than positive showing distribution. This tells you that non-U.S. markets really emerging as, as strength. So my suggestion is if you don't have some international exposure, certainly look at some of the non-U.S. markets and see where there might be an opportunity to spread out your, uh, your bets outside of the U.S. That's our show for today on Monday, November 4th. I want to thank all of you so much for tuning in today. And always, you can get to us on, uh, via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. Get to us also on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. Hope to see many of you in Las Vegas this week. And uh, thanks again from Redmond, Washington. This is Dave Keller. Have a good night.